Thank you all once again for being here at the Centre for Independent Studies Leadership Lunch today, where we're fortunate to be able to hear from the Honourable Christian Porter, Minister for Social Services in the Australian Government. Minister Porter has been Minister for Social Services since 2015, prior to which he was Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister, tasked with the continuation of the government's red tape cutting agenda and the cyber security strategy. Minister Porter has also served in the West Australian State Government, holding the portfolios of Attorney General, Minister for Corrective Services and Treasurer of Western Australia. In his life outside of politics, Minister Porter worked as a lawyer in both commercial and government settings, including a senior state prosecutor and was a university lecturer and professor of law. In his current portfolio, Minister Porter has responsibility for the single largest area of government expenditure. He has therefore placed a strong focus on welfare reform to restrain unnecessary growth in expenditure and to ensure the budget is spent efficiently to achieve better outcomes both for taxpayers and for welfare recipients themselves. As part of that objective, he's been pioneering in Australia the investment approach to welfare spending that has been successful in New Zealand. Today, he'll be talking to us about some of the challenges and the issues in achieving these important goals. Please welcome Minister Porter. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction, Jennifer, and I'll get straight into it. It's a great pleasure to be here at the CIS. I think I got my first um, Centre for Independent Studies uh, publication when I was 16 and have been receiving them continually since. So your mail list is very good. Um, it's followed me around. Probably also speaks volumes for my social life as a teenager, but <laughs> things haven't improved much. Uh, I think that one of the things that, having been interested in through organisations like the CIS and public policy for a long time, um, is that one absolutely golden rule that if you <coughs> misunderstand or mischaracterise a problem in public policy, you will invariably come up with a stupid policy answer. And we have worked very hard in the welfare space to really understand the problems. And I just wanted to talk briefly today, and I know that there's a Q and answer session at the end of this, so I'll be sort of loosely structured and fairly brief, but I wanted to talk about two real problems in the um, public policy area of welfare and how we went about defining them and understanding them and what we're doing to provide real reform and solutions to each of those areas. The first problem is about the sustainability of welfare spending and the second problem is around the structural complexity of the welfare system. So the sustainability problem um, was neither hard to identify and nor is it hard to describe but essentially when we took government in 2013, welfare spending was growing faster than taxpayers' ability to pay for it, which is a fairly succinct and I think quite accurate depiction of what was going on. And the result of failing to deal with that type of sustainability problem means that you just continually need to borrow more and more money. And that just means that you're funding today's welfare system growth um, by loading debt onto the government's credit card, which eventually has to be repaid by all of our children in the future in high taxes. Well, that's just the simple fact of what happens when you let welfare expending get out of control. And I just think that outcome should be absolutely unacceptable to Australians, because when you're borrowing money to fund present expenditure growth, you're just leaving the next generation with no choice but to pay for the welfare system of their own time and to simultaneously back pay for the welfare system of our time. And that ultimately is the worst form of taxation without representation. Because you are forcing a tax bill on people who, at the moment, are completely unrepresented in the political system. So that just should be an absolutely unacceptable outcome. Um, you only prevent that outcome if you make for a sustainable welfare system. So um, describing why it is that the welfare system was unsustainable when we inherited government in 2013, I think it's fairly straightforward. Um, under Labor, under six years, the welfare system grew at astonishing rates. Uh, at one point under Labor, under the uh, Rudd Gillard Rudd years, the total amount of money spent on welfare was more than 100% of all the income tax collected in Australia. So just wrap your head around that. We were sp of all the money collected in income tax, we were spending that plus some on the welfare bill, more than 100%. Now that figure under this government has come down to about 80%, still a very large figure. 80% of all of the income tax collected in Australia is spent on welfare. Um, one very good piece of news in the last budget as we slowly 
and grindingly get this problem under control is that in 2018-19 the government will no longer be borrowing to fund recurrent expenditure growth in the welfare system um, and, and in other areas. And I would have thought that would be probably the best ever news for every young Australian, although it's not very glamorous news, but that actually means that in 2018 we will no longer be borrowing money to pay for welfare expenditure. And how did this sort of happen? I'll just show you a couple of quick slides, or at least I hope I will, my efforts. At which way should I be pointing? Keep trying, that's great advice. <laughs> there we go. We'll go one forward again. Am I doing that or is someone else doing that? Ah, uh, gotcha. Uh, here we go. Here we go. Okay, so uh, first thing I did when I became minister two years ago, and I recall it very well because I was sworn in as a cabinet minister on a Monday. My first child was born on Tuesday morning, so I was kind of dealing with a baby and 24 lever arch folders of incoming ministerial briefs. But the first thing that we did was, and this is a very simplified version of it, but we um, did a full Excel spreadsheet breakdown of all of the categories of expenditure growth. As I say, this is a very simplified version of it, but we also did it right down to the levels of subgroups and cohorts in each of the welfare areas so that we could pick up sensitivities inside different growth areas. And just what you'll see there, I've highlighted a few of the um, interesting ones in yellow, although they're all interesting. When we inherited government, if you take your eye down there to the job seeker in income support, so basically unemployment benefits, when we inherited government, unemployment benefits were growing at an average of 13.5% a year. 13.5% right? a year. And we've brought that down to about 3.7. 13.5% a year growth in unemployment benefits is a very sad result because it represents far too many people each year going into the welfare system and not coming out and getting a job. But it is just monstrously unsustainable. I mean, if you looked at that in terms of running a business and that was an expenditure growth item, uh, that was outstripping revenue growth by four or five-fold. Um, then you have a look there at the age pension was growing at 8.2% of the year. We've got that down to 4%. The disability support pension was growing at 9.5% a year and we've now got that down into negative growth. When we came to government, there were 830,000 Australians on the disability support pension. When you took children out of the equation, that was one in 20 Australians of working age on the disability support pension. What's been very interesting is as we've tightened that up, we decline people's um, applications for disability support pension at higher rates than the previous government, and nearly half the people we decline do not end up in the welfare system at all. So you just see there, I think it gives you a bit of a, a flavour of what we've been dealing with, and then income support for carers is also coming down. Family tax benefits there was growing previously at 4% a year, now at negative 3.6. And this is policy effort, right? So um, the 8.2% down to 4.0% for the age pension was the decision to change the assets test, essentially. Now, I've got to put to you that is grindingly hard political work on the ground, very difficult to move through Parliament. Uh, again, uh, policy decisions around family tax benefits, policy decisions around the disability support pension. Uh, job growth has been part of the success in getting expenditure in job seeker payments under control. It's just a graphical representation of it that gives you an idea of um, how significant and how important these results are. And just by way of putting this into sort of a, a overarching context, since the 2013 ele election, cumulatively, um, the coalition government has delivered combined savings in the federal budget of $150 billion. And $25 billion of that has been achieved since the 2016 election. And again, that is grindingly difficult political work because if you think of something like, um, in my area, the school kids bonus and the income support bonus, which we ended, which Labor started, which is why they ended up spending more than 100% of personal income tax on welfare, uh, they were supposed to be paid for the school kids bonus and the income support bonus out of re revenue from the mining tax. Um, the mining tax only collected 0.1% of the revenue that it was designed to garner. So they were spending money on welfare that had never been raised in taxes. But making a decision to end the school kids bonus 
is absolutely the right decision for the country. It's certainly the right decision for the kids who enter the tax system in the future. It is grindingly difficult political work. But in any event, that I think just gives you a quick overview of the structural issue. And the problem's clear, I think it can be easily explained, and the solutions to it are to slow down welfare expenditure growth to reasonable levels. It's still a massive amount of money. We still have a massively generous welfare system and a very targeted welfare system. Uh, but this has been the endeavour over the first several years of government. So that was year one um, for me. And as we have slowly brought that <coughs> situation under control, uh, we have been turning our mind, uh, myself and Alan Tudge, the Human Services Minister, and Michaelia Cash, the Employment Minister, to the second problem, which is about the structure of the welfare system. And just going back to this idea that if you engage in reform, you've got to be absolutely precise in your ability to identify the problem, um, identifying the expenditure out of control problem was not hard. Uh, identifying the complexity and structural problems inside the welfare system was significantly more complicated. And when Michaelia Cash and Alan Tudge and I, uh, 18 months ago, really started looking into this, the problem with defining and identifying the problems in the structure of the welfare system is that there are so many problems. I mean, they are just everywhere and they intersect and they compound. So we had to look through the working age system, which is what we've focused on, and you've got to uncover all the different individual problems. You've got to understand each individual cause and effect. You've got to understand how one set of problems interact with another set of problems. And then you've got to try and unpack ways in which you can deliver solutions to each of those set of problems. So just by way of explaining the major problems in the structure and complexity of the welfare system. The welfare system works fairly well for people who do the right thing. And overwhelmingly, people do the right things. So about two thirds of people inside the welfare system either never miss an appointment or do not miss more than one appointment in a six month period, two thirds. About a quarter of the people who are granted new start are off the payment inside three months. And would you believe the correlation between the people who move up from new start quickly and the people who do the right thing is very, very high. And so what we have done is focus reform around the group of people who don't do the right thing because they are often the people who are on new start for longer periods of time. And the determination that we made, and I'm not an engineer, um, but it, this is a system which is on, is on the edge of what would an engineer would call cascading failure, where if you have components of the system that start to fail, they put pressure on other parts of the system which might, always, might otherwise be working quite well, but they themselves start to fail. So by identifying the component parts that were working very badly, you have the ability to restructure the system in a way that you're not stressing the system overall. And if you don't do that, you can get what an engineer I think would call cascading failure where one part of the system fails, the nearby parts try and take up the slack and they start to fail in due course. So, and of course in welfare, if we're failing in component parts of the welfare system, we're failing to improve individual human lives in Australia. So by way of rough description, if two thirds of people are doing the right thing and the welfare system is working quite well for them, the major problem with the welfare system and its structures and its complexity is that we've been putting too many people in too many hard baskets for too long and just essentially ignoring them. So just give you a few examples here. Well, this is uh, the slide that shows you overall the effect of that welfare growth, expenditure growth reduction. So red is what we inherited overall from Labor, which is just under 7%. Blue is where we're at, which is just under, I think it's 5%. And the second blue is where we're projected to go, but we will improve on that. The shaded bit there is the NDIS. So even with the NDIS coming on board, which is totally new expenditure after $22 billion, because of the ability to rein in overall expenditure growth, um, we can afford the NDIS. There's still a lot of work to do there, as you will see, but just imagine for a moment that light blue, that light blue shaded line on the far right sitting on top of the red line, of the red bar. Because had we not got welfare expenditure growth under control, that's what we'd be looking at. The complexity of the system, this um, is, I've had teams, hundreds of management consultants working on this for months. And this is the, that's an exaggeration, of course, we wouldn't spend your money that way. But 
But this represents the simplest possible way that we can show to you the compliance system inside the existing welfare framework. I'm not even going to try and describe it, but essentially there are 17 different types of non-compliance compliance events which could potentially trigger one or multiple of six different types of failure. So while most people never miss an appointment, for the one third of people who regularly miss appointments, this is the compliance system and it is just way too complicated. I mean, literally you need a PhD to understand it. Um, we've got 100,000 people who persistently miss appointments for things like turning up to job interviews, persistently. And 100,000 is in context of the money that's spent a large number. And what is fascinating is as we've looked through this, about half of that 100,000 people who persistently miss things like job interviews are not assessed by us as having any barriers to employment whatsoever. 50,000 people. So how is it that, you know, 40 to 50,000 people just systemically game the system? It's because the compliance system is dysfunctional, utterly dysfunctional. Um, I'll give you a few facts that we've managed to drill out by investigating the compliance system. In 2016, there were 380,000 occasions where people missed an appointment without a reasonable excuse. So things like turning up to your job active provider, turning up to a job interview. So 380,000 missed appointments in 2016. Only 10% of those ever resulted in any kind of financial penalty. 10% of 380,000. And the present compliance system which is represented there is astonishingly slow. So it takes 12 weeks of inadequate job search before any financial penalty is applied and even then the financial penalty can be waived. So even if you eventually get a financial penalty, it occurs so far after the event for which you're being penalised that it's completely meaningless as, as a tool to change behaviour and to turn those 100,000 into the two-thirds who always do the right thing. And the system is also failing the other half, the 50 or th so thousand who are missing appointments and do have barriers to employment because we're not identifying the barriers early enough and then engaging with them in enough detail to understand the barriers and do something about those. So what have we done? And there's a 250 odd page bill before Parliament to completely reform the structure of the welfare system. We're doing three things. One is that we are completely redrafting root and branch reform the compliance system for welfare. Um, simply put, we are scrapping that, a line goes through it, and we're going to have a simple demerits point system, just like everyone has on their licence. And if you get four demerit points and then you get another one, then you're out of the system, you're not paid for a week. Uh, if you get another one, second strike, you're not paid for two weeks. And if you get a third strike, you're out for a month. Very, very simple and immediate so that the response comes very quickly and close in time to the thing that you're not doing, that you should be doing. Um, we're also, so one's compliance, two is we're simplifying the system. This is Patrick McClure's depiction of his simple depiction of the welfare system. This is the simplest depiction visually he could give you, good people, of the Australian welfare system. So there are um, or were, when we inherited government, 20 different income support payments, each with different rules, taper rates, eligibility criteria, assets and income tests. And um, essentially, we are merging six different working age payments that exist in, at the moment into one working age payment. It will be called job seeker payment because that's what it is. I think New Start was a terrible name. If you're on this payment, you're seeking employment. That's what the payment is for. And then you'll see in the final box there on the right, the third thing that we're doing is we're strengthening mutual obligation requirements. <clears throat> because there are all these different payment types on the left, which we're now turning into one payment type, job seeker, with a new compliance framework around it, there are all these different mutual obligations and they just made no sense how they would distinguish between groups of people. So for instance, it might surprise you to know, because it certainly surprised me to find out, that at the moment, for a person on Newstart who is over 55, there is actually no requirement to engage in job search. None. So part of this process is that we actually change the rules so that a person over 55 has a requirement to engage in job search. 
Uh, interestingly, also under the present system, uh, the number of hours that we require someone to engage in job search is different um, for job seekers under 30 and job seekers over 30. So a 31-year-old has a different obligation in terms of how much time they have to spend job, job searching than a 32-year-old. 49's not old. And I know because I'm 47. Like, it, the, the system was just astonishing in its inconsistency, in its complexity. So we are very much tidying all of that up. And I'll just, I'll flip that one. I don't usually have this slide in here, but it's a very interesting one. This, one of my favourite slides. So there's a rule in the system presently that says that you can, because the, the pay cycle in Centrelink payments is two weeks, there's a rule in the system presently that says that you can miss appointments for two weeks and you'll get suspended, like your payment gets suspended, unless you engage at the end of the two-week cycle. So we drilled down into all the data and those spikes there are the number of people engaging on the last day of the two-week cycle. So you'll see there that thousands and thousands, and, and on the left is if they're doing it once and on the right is if they're doing it multiple times. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people don't do anything for two weeks and face suspension and then engage on Friday afternoon. And um, it's difficult to know with complete precision, but I would suspect that these are people with jobs, probably cash jobs. And the reason that we'll find it hard to turn up to job interviews is because they're working. And that represents, I think, a massive failure of the system for the people involved in the system, for the taxpayer. And as I say, it can create cascading failure because it could put stress on other pressure on other parts of the system. So um, another good example, I think, of the way that the system fails people is the way that we treat people who are facing barriers to employment through drug and alcohol use. I'll just give you two examples that there are things inside the system known as fixed exemptions. So you can be exempted from your mutual obligations to search for work for periods of time, 13 weeks and above. And there are reasonable excuses if you don't turn up to things. And up until this point, uh, alcohol and drug problems have been both the basis for an exemption and the basis for an excuse without you having to also engage in treatment. And the instances of people using that excuse or that exemption have just grown astonishingly quickly. So um, the number of people who are using drug and alcohol as an exemption for not turning up to job interviews has doubled over the last five years. So there are now about 5,500 people who are exempted from searching for jobs because of a drug or alcohol problem. Get this one. The number of people who have been using alcohol consumption as an excuse for not turning up to an appointment, so an excuse rather than a fixed period of exemption, so they use it after not turning up, they will say to Centrelink, Centrelink will say, why didn't you turn up? And they will say, well, my excuse is that I have an issue with drug and alcohol. The number of people using that excuse increased by 131% last year. So that represents four and a half thousand odd people who are not turning up to job interviews um, because of the excuse of drug or alcohol consumption. There's 10,000 people out there and I would just argue we're just failing those people because they're the people that we've put into the too hard basket, they're excused out of what would otherwise be mutual obligations to search for work and that's it, that's the end of the story. So. We've also engaged as part of this with very thoroughgoing reforms around drug and alcohol. We changed the reasonable excuse and exemption requirements so that of course you can get a reasonable excuse or an exemption if you have a drug and alcohol problem, but you also must be doing something about that problem. But that is the conditionality now of the excuse. And if we just ignore that, we allow people to just get completely disconnected from the system. So we will now insist that exemptions or excuses for drug and alcohol abuse are accompanied by a commitment to seek treatment. And um, if the treatment isn't available then, and you're on a waiting list, then that's good enough, but you have to be seeking some form of treatment for your issue. Very importantly, and for the first time ever, this government will make sure that if you are seeking treatment for a drug or alcohol problem, that every single job seeker can have that counted towards their mutual obligations. It can actually be part of your job plan because it is a clearly important precursor for a lot of people who are suffering this barrier to employment. So we are saying what I think is very common sense 
conservative, dare I say it, approach. We're saying that the taxpayer will accommodate the excuse or exemption of alcohol or drug use, but you have to be doing something to help yourself as well. And this is part of trialling drug testing. It's not about punishing people, it's about trying to identify people <coughs> who have this problem but are not self-identifying. So on a first test, um, you would go on a cashless welfare system, so you have less cash to expend on welfare. On a second positive test, we will um, assess you at our expense, at the taxpayer's expense, if necessary, devise a treatment plan for you and require you as a conditionality of your welfare to go into that treatment process. And that treatment might be as simple as counselling or it might involve more sophisticated treatments. And that is a trial which will be run in three locations around Australia and if it works then we'll have another look at it and if it doesn't work then we'll try something else. But it's a willingness I think for these really hard to move groups inside the welfare system to actually do something to improve individual lives because the greatest enemy to people's own health, welfare and economic well-being is the completely passive acceptance of welfare. And what we found inside the system is far too many groups who fell into that category of completely passive acceptance of welfare. So I'll just end um, before I ask questions and I'm very happy to receive any and I'm sure that someone will ask about inequality and other matters and I hope you do because I've prepared some good data for you around that. Um, but I, I have found Warren Mundine's approach to these matters in Indigenous communities quite enlightening and he said and has said publicly that dependence is poverty, that the two are the same, just different sides of the same coin. He says dependence is poverty and the only escape from poverty is a job. So when Michaelia Cash and Alan Tudge and I sat down two years ago to look at this welfare reform, every single thing we did was directed towards a clear and stated purpose of trying to increase the number of people moving from welfare to work and to increase the speed with which they can move from welfare to work. That was the design principle. And I think that the design that we've got from before Parliament is, is going to get us much further towards achieving those goals than the system that we have at the moment. I just end by saying this. Um, so if, when I, I'm a lawyer, so sometimes when I say the last thing I'll say is the last thing I say, it's not always. So, um, But one of the things that I have found most perplexing when I deal with stakeholders in this area, and this is a view that's held by ACOS, I might say, is that there's an equivalency to money earned and money received. So I have sat in meetings with a range of stakeholders who say that if a job or series of jobs produces a similar amount of money, say for instance to the amount of money on a generous payment like disability support pension, then you're actually worse off with a job because you have the attenuating costs of transport and clothing and so forth. That to me is so wrong-headed as to be absurd because it misses the fundamental point about work is that before there was even such a thing as an exchange economy, work was always a form of giving to your community because you are offering something that you have which is valuable to your community. And eventually as exchange economies grew up, you were remunerated for that. But work is how people have meaning. It's where you have your friends. It's often where, like myself, you met your wife. Um, work structures and brings joy and meaning to people's lives. So the idea that there's an equivalency to money received and money earned, I think, is completely and utterly wrong-headed. And again, that's been something that's underpinned uh, what we're doing. I had one person at a press conference say to me, I may have been from the ABC actually, but they said, are you seriously saying that someone who's qualified as an aeronautical engineer should work in retail or tourism? Well, the two things to that are that, uh, they said, would they be happy working in retail or tourism? I said, that would depend on the individual. Um, the number of people who have degrees who go on MasterChef because they say they don't want to work in the law anymore because they want to be a sous chef is quite high. But that depends on the individual. But what is wrong with jobs in retail and tourism? I mean, when you meet people who run the Shangri-La Hotel in Singapore, they are having the most amazing time in the most amazing industry and very often they started um, working in bars and clubs around Sydney. So whether it's in disability care or retail and tourism and a whole range of jobs that are being generated, our job is to move people into those jobs. But thanks very much for um, hearing this short presentation today and obviously I'm very happy to take some questions.